Um, so uh, if you don't know, if you're new, um, I, we have lived here for uh, 17 years or so now. Um, but before that, we, we uh, grew up, my family, we grew up in southwest Missouri. And so it's about 20 years ago. I want to take you back uh, to Jennifer and I. We had just gotten married. Um, we've been married for 22 years uh, here in a couple of weeks. And um, it was one of those winters in Missouri that was brutal. Now, I know that we think we've got winter out here because it like gets to like 38 degrees and it's like, oh my gosh, I got to put a sweatshirt on. And it's like, you know, um, this, is, this is like the brutal kind of stuff. I mean, it was one of those times where it's like you're single digits, you know, you got wind chill taking it down into the negatives and, and we had had a really nice fall, you know, but that winter was just, it was brutal, brutal kind of winter. And so for us, we lived in this small little um, old farmhouse um, that had been remodeled a couple of times. And um, so we would just bundle up, turn the heat up, you know, those things. Didn't have a fireplace or anything like that. Um, but so us, we, we were able to stay comfortable. Um, but apparently um, there was like a mice ca- colony that lived outside of our house. And where they enjoyed the fall, um, they were hating the winter. And so they wanted um, our house to become their house. And so they just decided that they weren't going to have anything to do with that winter. And so they just started entering into our house. And we, it took us a little bit uh, to figure out where they were actually entering into the house. Um, so in the, in, until we could do that, we had to come up with a solution to deal with our mouse problem. So me being a thinker and a fixer, I went to Walmart and I bought a three pack at 97 cents for three of mice traps, you know, that just buy those there. And I was like, well, we're going to fix this problem. And so we would get these and we experimented with all kinds of things. I experiment so you don't have to. All right. So if you have a mouse problem, what you need is American cheese. All right. American cheese works. Um, I think we tried cheddar. We tried peanut butter, probably tried Monterey Jack, you know, all those things. But American cheese is the thing that works. You cram it down into the little bait trap. You set this thing and they are just like, I mean, they love this thing, okay? And so um, so one day, it was like a really, really cold day, and it was a rough day, and um, uh, we're friends here, right? So, like, you're not going to, like, judge me or anything like that. Can, can we just, like... All right, so here's, here's how it went. Um, we caught 13 mice in one day. 13 mice. In fact, um, it was amazing. Now, my wife is still mad at me um, because I was like, man, it's like three for 97 cents. She's like, can I just throw that away with the mouse on it? I was like, no, take it to the trash can, (laughs) empty the mouse out, and then reset that thing. Uh, We ain't made of money, you know? And it's just like, um, so she's she's still a little bitter about it. And so, but we would do it. We would set it, and uh, we'd be sitting there, and we'd be watching TV, and we'd be sitting there, and then all of a sudden you would hear... And they'd be like, oh, we got one, you know, and so we go in there and we grab it and dump it out. One of the most exciting days of my life, y'all, I am not kidding you at all, is I walked in there and there were two mice on the same trap. I caught them at the same time. It was amazing, all right? So eventually we found out what the problem was. There's a little hole, a little gap there at the dryer vent, shoved some steel wool in it. We never had the problem uh, again. But it, it just, I always think back to that day. I'm just like, how stupid mice are, you know? It's just like, how stupid are you? It's just like, I mean, did they wake up and take extra strength stupid pills that morning? It's just like, you know, they walk in there and it's just like, oh, wow, is that cheese? You know, it's like cheese. It's like, it's on a piece of wood with like a guillotine right there. But, you know, I'm sure that the cheese is worth it, right? And so I'm sure that I can jump in there and I can grab it. I imagine the little mice colony, you know, just having their conversations like, you seen Ralph lately? I'm like, no, Ralph said he was going to go get some lunch. And so, I don't know, he never came back. It's like, well, I'll go check out Ralph, you know? And so they walk into the house, and it's like, man, what is that? Is that cheese? You know? It's like, kind of smells like Ralph used to smell. But, um, you know, it's like, I, well, I don't know. And so they're just looking at it, and they're like, you bait the trap, they take the trap, you bait the trap, they take the trap. I mean, it's just amazing just how stupid mice are, right? You know, that they would just like walk up to like living death right in front of them for a piece of American cheese. Not even like Gouda, you know, like American cheese. Like, man. And then it made me think, it's like, I'm glad I'm not as stupid as a mouse, right? Because I would never walk up to something that is obviously screaming out, trap, 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 and think, you know what, this got other people before, but have you seen my reflexes? I'm pretty good at this kind of stuff. I mean, I know that other people have stumbled with this before, but surely 
I can avoid the trap. No, it's like the married guy. Maybe he's a little frustrated at work, a little frustrated at home. And so that kind of leads to this recipe of just like he's not feeling the love and attention that he wants at home. And so he's, it's all in his head. It's his fault. It's him. But he looks around. He sees this cute little thing in another cubicle over there. And, and he's just like, you know, I know other guys have like flirted with other gals that they weren't married to. And it ended up poorly for them. But I'm not other guys. Surely I'll be fine and just walk away. I mean, by, by, besides, it's just a little innocent flirting. I mean, who could that? Or it's like, you know, the, the guy that's like looking at it over his books and he's looking over the business and he's looking at things. He's like, oh my gosh. I mean, have you guys seen inflation? This is killing me. And I've tried fuel surcharges. I've tried all these other kind of things, but this year's just going to be rough. And you know what? If I move this number right over here and if I don't report that, then maybe I, I know that other people have gotten caught, but. Or maybe, you know, just kind of like lay around a little night at night and it's just like, man, I'm kind of bored and, you know. I just don't know what I'm going to do. And, you know, it's been a little... What was that website that I used to know about? I mean, surely just three minutes won't. Or, you know, it's just... I know that my family has a history of addiction. And I know that I've got, you know, like mental illness problems. And I, I know, but, I mean, the girls are going out for drinks and... I mean, I, I don't want to just be like a, the, the funny. I mean, it's just a couple of drinks. I mean, what could go? I'm so glad I'm not as stupid as a mouse, aren't you? To just see the bait and to never walk in and just have it catch me. You know, today we're beginning a brand new sermon series, and we're, we're going to be working through the book of James for the next few weeks, and we're just calling it a faith that works. That's really kind of the theme of the entire letter of James. You know, James, little brother of Jesus, didn't used to believe Jesus was the son of God. You know, and uh, then later, you know, after Jesus died and rose again, James be <coughs> believes. You know, he's not a skeptic any longer. He becomes a leader in the church. And he's writing this letter to these, to these Christians um, who appear to be struggling with some things. You know, some people think maybe they're struggling and they're, they're like tempted to like kind of go back to the old ways of doing things or just to leave the faith. Um, other people are just saying they're just like struggling. Like, how do you grow up in Christ? How do you actually mature in Christ? How do you actually, you know, become a, 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 a mature follower of, of Jesus? And so James is just writing down some instructions for them and just saying, hey, if you want a faith that works here, here's some things that, that you can do. And it's interesting as he starts off this, this letter uh, to these Christians, that's kind of where he jumps in. Now, he jumps in talking about troubles and, and, and just difficulties and things. And he's like, hey, whenever you're a Christian, he's like, I don't know if anybody ever told you this, but hey, just because you became a Christian doesn't mean your life will no longer have any troubles. He's like, if somebody told you that whenever you were making your decision to follow Christ, he's like, I apologize because that's not the case. If you are a follower of Jesus, you will have troubles, okay? You just know it. You're going to face difficulty. You're going to have you know, difficult seasons. He's like, but consider it an opportunity for great joy. Okay. Why? Because it's through the testing of your faith, the refining of your faith. Like a silversmith takes the chunk of metal, throws it in the fire, removes all the crud, and eventually gets it to the place to where he can see his face in the silver. He's like, that's what troubles do is that God is putting you through the fire. So at the end of the day, whenever everything's all said and done, whenever he looks at you, his face will reflect off of your Life and your faith. He's like, this is just kind of the way it goes. So do, just because you became a Christian doesn't mean that you're no longer going to deal with difficult times. But then, starting off in verse 12, is he jumps into this idea of, he's like, hey, I don't know if anybody ever told you this, but just because you became a Christian doesn't mean you're never going to deal with temptation any longer. It doesn't mean that all your evil desires are just going to magically just kind of melt away and you're never going to have that issue any longer. You're still going to have to learn. If you want to have a faith that works, you're going to have to learn to deal with the trap and how to handle temptation. So if you got your Bible, let's look at James chapter 1 and let's jump down there to verse 12 and let's just see what he has to say. Four verses this morning. This is what he says. He says, God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. And remember, all right, ready? When you are being tempted, don't say, God is tempting me. 
Because God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. Instead, temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. And these desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. He says, when you're being tempted, right? When, not if, (laughs) it's when. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you're never going to deal with temptation any longer. We've got to learn to do this. If you want to have a faith that works, we've got to learn to deal with temptation. It's going to happen. You're never exempt from it. The trap is always going to be there. And James wants us, he wants his readers to know. He's like, you've got to be ready. You've got to be able to identify what the trap is and how to deal with it. He says, so when you are being tempted, he's like, don't say God is tempting me. In fact, I love the way that James phrases this, and and literally how he puts it is like this. It's like a forceful command. Uh, You could translate it like this. Don't you dare say that God is the one doing it. Okay? It's like your mama said to you at some point. Don't you dare talk to me like that. It is just like James saying that. He's saying, don't you dare say that God is the one that's doing this. Because God doesn't tempt anyone. God is never tempted. He's like, that's not what's going on. What's happening? He's like, well, temptations, they come from... Our own desires. They come from within. It's our own desires. Our our desires are are the bait. Our desires are the thing that are dragging us, that are enticing us to try to come there and to take the bait. He's like, it's us. It's, It's from within. And I know that in the year 2022, nobody likes to hear that you're the problem. But that's what James is saying. He's like, it's not your mama's fault. It's not your daddy's fault. It's not your neighbor's fault. It's not your co-worker's fault. The problem is within you. It's your own desires. Take some personal responsibility here and look inside of you. It's like you don't get to walk around and blame everybody else for the problems that you have. You don't get to go, it's not my fault. James says, no, it is. It is within you. And the reason you can't see it, have you ever thought about this? Is that sin blinds us to our blindness? It it blinds us to our blindness. We are so blind to our sin, we can't even see it any longer. And so that's why we need the word of God to come into us and go, hey, no, hold on. It's not God's fault. It's not the devil's fault. It's not that. It's you. It's the evil desires within you. That's what's stirring all of this stuff out. We are tempted because we have a desire within. Now, generally, here, this this is how it kind of works, right? It's generally, it's a good desire that ends up twisted to being a bad desire. Like, like, take this, like, like your desire to be loved, to experience affection, you know, whether that be relational, whether that even be just physical desire, physical affection, that is not a bad thing. That is a God created thing. It is something that he put inside of us. And so that's not a bad thing. But what does evil do? What does sin inside of me do? What does sin living in you do? Is it takes that and in our brokenness, it takes what is good and it twists it into something that is evil. And it twists it into something and says, hey, this is what you should pursue of all costs. This is the thing that matters more than anything. How in the world could you be happy and not be you know, active physically with other people? Of course, you've got to be doing those kind of things. And so what does that do is it leads us to chase after our physical desires, our physical wants. It causes us to cross lines, to cross boundaries. And if it is not put in check, it will it'll destroy you. I take this. Like your desire... To be financially secure and to be financially, you know, well off is not necessarily a bad thing. Proverbs talks about how a wise man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. So it's not a bad thing to say, hey, I want to I be wise financially. But what does evil do inside of us? Left unchecked is it takes that desire which is good and it shifts it and it twists it and it becomes selfish pursuit of more, 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 more. It becomes about greed and about holding on and holding on. And that temptation is what ends up grabbing us and destroying us. You know, it's interesting. Uh, Whenever Jesus talks, Jesus never says, hey, like, watch out for, like, lustful thoughts. He never says, like, watch out that you don't kill somebody or anything like that. You know what he does say? Watch out for greed. Do you ever realize that nobody's greedy except for somebody else? Because that's what sin does. Is it takes that desire 
for financial security and it blinds us to our blindness and we pursue it above all costs and we, we become greedy people. And so James says, you are tempted when your own desire, your own selfish desires, your own selfish ambition, and it drags you and it lures you like a mouse to the trap. He's like, so you got to be on guard against it. And it's going to lie to you. It's going to tell you, it's okay. It's just a few bit. It's not, it's not that big of a deal. It's going to be fine knowing that the trap is set and ready to grab us. He's like, it's our own sinful desires. It's our own sinful thoughts. It's our own sinful ambitions that entice us and drag us away. And those desires give birth to sinful actions. Because after we give in to the desire, then it begins to work itself out. You know, whenever we don't say no, we don't run away, we go with it. And we're like, hey, being tempted, let's say this, being tempted is not the problem. Your problem is not that you're tempted. Our problem is, is that is that we don't learn to say no, that we don't learn to fight. Jesus was tempted in every way but was without sin. So it's, our problem is not that we're tempted. It's that we're not leaning into the power of the Spirit inside of us. And he says, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. And the, the word picture that, that James uses here is just, it's, it's, it's actually kind of graphic. Um, it is the picture, um, the word picture of a stillborn birth. One of the saddest things on the planet. And so you can just kind of see, so what sin does is it gives the appearance, it gives the illusion that there is life that is being created. But whenever it is fully developed, it gives birth to death. It'll take you out. See, my friend, sin is not like this light, casual thing to joke about. It's a, it's a deadly game. And here's what I know. <clears throat> you can only be a fun-loving sinner for so long. Eventually, the bill will be paid. Whether in this life or after this life. And that's what James's point. And who's the plane? It's me. It's it's you. We're, we're the ones to blame because it's our bait that we are saying yes to. We're the ones going into the trap. We're the ones who are not leaning into the power of the Spirit and saying, God, you've got to help me find the way out of this. So here, here's, here's what I want you to know about temptation, all right? Just three quick truths for you, all right? Real quick. Here's the deal. You're not above temptation. You will face temptation, and there's always a way out of temptation, all right, and so here's what we're going to do. We're going to do just a real quick exercise, and we're going to personalize this real quick. So let's go ahead and throw that screen back up there, Jerry. And um, let's, let's say those out loud together. I am not above temptation. I will face temptation. There is always a way out of my temptation. You guys ready? Let's personalize it. Ready? I'm not above temptation. I will face temptation. And there is always a way out of my temptation. Okay? It's going to happen. So if we are going to have a faith that works, if we are going to face temptation, the question is, how do we work our way through temptation? So let me give you three questions to ask whenever you are facing temptation. This is the way out. Question number one is just this. Who can help me? Ask the question. Who, who can help me? Because the fatal flaw that you carry inside yourself and that I carry inside myself, this is what sin blinds us to, is that we think we can just fix this on our own. And we think that we can fight this on our own, that we can fight the battle on our own, and that we're, we're in this all together. In fact, one of the big warning lights that should be going off on your spiritual dashboard is whenever you are encountering something and you have this thought, I can't talk to anybody about this. I have to keep this a secret. You know, on your, 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 your dashboard, you've got those engine warning lights that start flashing. And you guys know that there are some that are more serious than others, like the check engine light. Oh, who cares about that? You know, but um, it's just like, but if something starts blinking at you kind of thing, you're like, that's, there's probably something wrong. This is a blinking light on the dashboard. Whenever you think, I, ha I cannot tell anybody this. That should be like the first sign for you to go, oh, dear, I'm in trouble. Because here's the truth. You're only as sick as your secrets. You've probably heard us say that before, right? 
And whenever we think we can't share it with somebody else, whenever we can't go to somebody and say, hey, I need some help dealing with this issue, that's whenever we are already in a place to where we're about to take the bait. And the trap is about to close. So who can help me? Who can help me? You know, who, who can I trust? Who can I tell everything with? Who can I be honest with? Who can I have no secrets with and say it's well with my soul? Who can help me? And that's the first question in fighting temptation. It's like who, who is going to be there with me to help me go through this? Here's question number two is where does this lead? And, and this, is, this is a hard question to ask, okay? Because what we're saying is, is if, if I give in to this temptation, what road does it take me down? If I take this drink, if I hit this, you know, puff, if I, you know, click that sign, if I do this, where will I end up? Where will my family end up? Where will my relationships end up? Where will my life end up? If I walk down this road, will this lead me to becoming the person that I want to be or away from whom I want to become? I'll tell you guys, this question here is such an important question. This is the question uh, for me um, whenever I'm tempted or, you know, battling temptation or anything. This question here is the one that probably keeps me in line uh, better than any other question. I'm just telling you that. Because it's like, if I give in to this thought or if I were to do X, what would that do to Jennifer? Do I ever want to have to sit down my son AJ and my daughter Jaden and, and explain to them why dad did X? And then it even goes further. It's like, do I ever want to have to get up in front of all y'all and just go, hey, I need to have a little chat with you? I mean, what happens to, to the church if, if I do something stupid, right? You know, then what about all the mentors and the men and, you know, the, the, that have just poured themselves into me? Do I want to have to look them in the eye or answer that phone call and then go, what were you thinking? I don't want to deal with that. Where does it lead? This, this will keep you in mind. If you can have the end goal in the end of your mind, in, in sight, this will keep you going straight. And, and now, the, now here's the trick though, okay? You guys ready? It's really hard to do this and to ask this question in the moment of temptation. You have to ask this question before you're even faced with temptation. Because here's what I know, and you know this to be right, okay, is that everything feels right in the moment, but that doesn't make it right. So we've got to pre-ask this question and say, all right, if I were to go down this road, where, where would it lead me? That can help avoid even walking up to the trap. Here's the last question. What should I value most? Now notice, I didn't say what do I value the most? Because once again, in the moment, you may not be able to answer that question well. It's what should I? What is the most important thing that I should, should be you know, valuing in this moment? Because the battle against temptation is a great and it's a noble fight. But if you are simply trying to suppress your desires, you will wear out. You'll get exhausted. And the lure will be too strong. And so we remember why this is so important in the first place. It's because of what we value. I mean, think about it. Men, I mean, your family's at stake, right? Your marriage is at stake. Your relationship with your kids is at stake. Your job could be at stake. Your friendships are at stake. If you're a believer in Christ, listen to me, your walk with Him is at stake. Your, your witness to your one and to those who are around you is at stake. You are at stake. I mean, if heaven is real, right? If forever is a really long time and if hell is real, you're at stake. Your eternity is at stake. Well, what should I value the most? What should be the most important thing in my life? And that is to be a faithful, devoted follower of Jesus Christ. It's the only thing that matters at the end of the day. 
to be faithful to the one who gave himself up for me. So here's the bottom line. Whenever it comes to temptation, it's I can't win when I give in. I just can't. And I don't know about you, I want to win, okay? I, I want to win. And I can't win when I give in. And you can't win when you give in to temptation either. So here, here's the challenge. Now, James chapter 1, verse 22 says, hey, don't just be hearers of the word, be doers of the word as well. Don't just listen to the word, but actually do what it says. So we'd be kind of foolish not to continue along with challenges throughout this series, right? So here's, here's the challenge for the week. It's just this. You need to spend 15, 5, 10, 15 minutes this week of just making a physical list of here is what is at stake. My relationships, you know, my marriage, you know, um, you know my reputation, all those kind of things. Who... And what will be affected if you give in and you take the bait of sin? Who and what will be affected if you give in and you don't faithfully endure the testing that is there to make you pure? Name the cost. Write a list. And then maybe, maybe stick it on the dashboard not over the warning light, okay, but stick it on the dashboard and remind yourself every single day, this is what is at stake. Because you will be tempted. You're not above it. But God does provide a way out of your temptation. And you can't win if you give in. Several years ago, I read the story about a guy, and I don't remember where I read it, but his name was Gary Richmond. And uh, Gary Richmond happened to work at a zoo. (laughs) Um, I don't know what zoo, but it sounds like a terrible zoo to work at because it had a 13-foot-long king cobra. Um, Yeah, no, right? And that says, no, 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 no. I need a transfer right now. Um, But it had venom glands in it that had enough poison to kill a 1,000 adults. Okay, super poisonous. And this cobra... Okay, this particular cobra had a scar that made him look like the embodiment of evil if he didn't already, all right? But worse, it meant that whenever that snake shed his skin, the eye cap didn't come off on its own. It had to be removed by hand. And in case you didn't know, snakes don't have hands, all right? (laughs) So this required a team of five people to take this one little eye cap off of the 13-foot-long king cobra. Two zookeepers, the zoo curator, a veterinarian, and Gary. (laughs) (laughs) Gary's job was just to hand a scalpel and a sponge to the vet. So the day comes to where they've got to, you know, help the snake get this eye cap off. And so the cobra slithers out from its den and it jumps, I mean, you know, it just like raises up, spreads its cape, you know, and it's just raising up full stature, looks at the five intruders and decides which one is going to be his first victim. And so he decides it's going to be the curator. And so he just like darts at the curator. And so like lightning speed, they throw the nets around the snake. The curator grabs the snake behind the venom glands. And the vet says, well, let's get this over with. And his hands, I mean, you can just imagine, they're, 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 they're trembling. Sweat is dripping off everybody but the snake. You know, and the vet asks if Gary, he looks at Gary and says, do you have any cuts on your hands? He's like, no, I'm good. He's like, good. So grab these paper towels and shove them in the snake's mouth. (laughs) So Gary does. He wads them up, shoves them in the cobra's mouth, and it bites and it chews until the towels are yellow, just dripping with the venom. And as the team worked, you know, like the curator's like, oh, a teaching moment. And so he he starts to just explain. He's like, hey, you know, every year, several full-size grown elephants die from a king cobra bite. Isn't that neat to know, you know? And and it's like a man could never survive a bite, you know, with a full load of venom from this guy. And so he's like, hey, Gary, that's why I've got your hand near its mouth, you know, draining the the, the, the venom sacks out of him. And so the curator, his hands are sweating, the muscles are weakening, his fingers are starting to cramp up, which is not good news for anyone except for the snake, you know? And so the curator wasn't sure that they could move quickly enough when it was time for the release. After they've got the eye cap off and they've got everything there, he's just like, oh my goodness, I don't know if we're going to be able to move quickly enough. It's like, well, you could have told me that before we were doing this job. But then he explains what we can call the secret of the snake. You guys ready for this? He said this about snakes. More people are bitten 
trying to let go of snakes than when they grab them. Because they're easy to grab, but hard to let go. Let's say that again. Because they're easy to grab, but they're hard to let go. Temptation promises that you can take the bait at any time. And it's going to be easy. It's not going to be a big deal. I mean, it's just your own personal decision, right? And it promises you that it's just a little bit. It's not a huge deal. It's going to be okay. I mean, and you can feed your appetite at all costs. And you can see the cheese. You can eat the cheese. And no consequences. It's easy to grab. But it's hard to let go. It's really hard to let go. And it, it always promises freedom. It always promises freedom. It always promises to be temporary. It always promises to be easy to let go. But it makes us a slave. It grips us and it will bite us. And ultimately, it will kill us. You you can't win when you give in. You can't win. So be aware of the trap. Don't take the bait. And don't get bit. And today, here's the good news. Is that as we wrestle through our tests and our trials and the temptations that we go through, um, there is nothing that we have faced that Jesus Christ did, didn't either. He has faced it all. Hebrews chapter 4 talks about how we have this great high priest who can sympathize with us because he was tempted in every way that we have been tempted, but yet he was without sin. He never give, gave in. He never took the bait. He was always able to say no. And so he is now the source of our strength. And so it's not just a, hey, buck up and get your willpower going here. This is no, let's lean into the power of the one who is in us because greater is he who is in you than the one who is in the world. And Christ in you is stronger than the wrong desires in you. You can do this because where you are weak, he is strong. And so every temptation, have you ever thought about this? Every temptation is an opportunity to depend on him. And so as we face our temptations, Christians... We go, oh my goodness, I'm still being developed. I'm still growing. I'm still alive. I still have a pulse, so I'm still going to deal with those thing, these things. But Jesus, here I am. And I'm asking you for your strength and your grace to help me to say no to this. If you're not a Christian, I just say this, you're fighting with one arm tied behind your back. If not both of them. And you're not going to be able to do this on your own. And if you're sitting there and maybe you're watching online, maybe you're in the room, you're just like, I don't understand why I keep going back and going back and going back and going back. It's like, well, have you ever considered? Have, have you ever considered that you're fighting a losing battle because you're trying to do this through your power and not the power of the Holy Spirit that could be living in you? The power of Christ could be in you, but that only happens whenever we say yes to him, whenever we devote ourselves to him, whenever we give ourselves over to him. Yet that's when that happens. So maybe today is a great day for you to say, you know what, Jesus? I understand that you understand what, I've been, what I'm going through right now, but you are without sin. Can you, can you save me from my sin? Can you save me from the trap? Can you make me one of yours? And so if you're, you're watching online and if you want to make a decision, if you're ready to make a decision to, to follow Christ... Uh, we invite you to visit the website that's on the screen right now. If you're in the room, then I'd love for you to grab that connection card that's in your bulletin right there. And, and if you're ready to make a decision, just flip it over on the backside and just say, hey, I'm ready to begin following Christ. Or I've got questions about this. Or what does this look like? Or hey, can you pray for me? Because the temptation is super strong right now. And then hand that off to an usher as you're leaving today. Or better yet, you can bring it up to me after service. And let's pray. Let's talk about what the Lord is doing in your life. But I promise you this, he, he is greater than your temptations. And he is there for you in your darkest moments. So lean into his power, not into yours. So Jesus, today, we're just asking that you would see temptation as an opportunity to depend on you.
And God, we know that our sin blinds us to our blindness. And so today, would you just through the, the, the power of your scriptures, through your inspired word, would you please um, illuminate some dark spots, some blind spots to us today and help us to see that in a lot of ways, um, we can just be like stupid mice. See the cheese, eat the cheese, think we're going to be okay. But some of us, uh, we've been seeing the cheese, eating the cheese, and uh, we've walked in today with, today with a lot of wounds and scars because of the desires that are in us. And maybe today, for the first time, uh, we're ready to lay down our arms to quit resisting, to quit fighting you. And to say, Jesus, the way I've been doing things isn't working, so would you please... I'm ready to follow you. And so, God, would you give us the courage to step out and to say that? God, for some of my friends today, it's, um, it's been a tough season. Maybe they've been fighting a lot of temptation and they're tired. And would you give them the strength to carry on? Maybe some of my friends, they've just been dealing with um, all kinds of tests and trials. And they were like, hey, I, I'm, I'm struggling to consider it pure joy right now. Would you just remind them today that you are at work in us, refining us to be the people you've called us to be. So Holy Spirit, give us the power that we need as we walk out today. And we pray this in your wonderful name. Amen.